Welcome back to another edition of the Edge Podcast. Publisher Brennan Slaughter here for BeaversEdge.com, joined by Beaver's Edge writer and KGO radio host TJ Matthewson. We're coming to you following Oregon State's win over number 10, Utah, 21 to 7, to improve to 4 and 1 on the season, 1 and 1 in Pac 12 play on a Friday night. We're coming to you on a Saturday as we're recording this podcast. Uh, I'm going to be uh, out of town this next week, so TJ and I figured we'd get a head start on the podcast. Uh, look ahead to the Cal Golden Bears, which managed to win. Today, as we're uh, recording this podcast, uh, so they'll be coming off a win as they play Oregon State down in the Bay Area next week. Uh, we'll get to that later, but TJ, what's going on, man? Uh, I just saw you. <laughs> yeah, I just saw you too, but it sounded like a bit of a late night for you, so we're able to give you some time to, to rest up and, <laughs> and get ready to hop on here and, and, and give the best analysis there is. You know, what a <laughs> night at Research Stadium last sure night. Was. The environment was great. The flyover was super cool. And I think the Beavers did what they were supposed to. We said this was going to be a slow, muddy, hard-nosed, physical football game that whichever team makes the least amount of mistakes will do. And I think that qualifies for the Beavers. They had essentially had two good drives running the football, and that's all they needed in the first half to uh, defeat a Utah team that's offense looked tough they yeah they were uh, they were struggling I'm I'm shocked they even got into the end zone there at the end of the game and what I qualify as garbage time it oh, was a, a supreme defensive effort by Oregon State to not let the backup quarterback Nate Johnson yeah. or Bryson Barnes do any damage against you yeah I mean there's a lot of layers to break down but let's definitely start uh, on the defense TJ as you mentioned I mean Trent Bray you know, we know we've talked to him quite a bit. He's a very competitive dude. I mean, a dude that, you know, is gonna, you know, you know, just to, you know, probably stay late at the office, you know, the last one to leave the practice field, always out there, you know, physically running with his guys, you know, high energy, just a natural competitor. Knowing that, and then again, reading between the lines, you know, TJ and I talked about it a little bit uh, in this last week's edition of the podcast. But Oregon State defense not meeting the media this week, with the exception of Joe Golden, who, again, very reserved, fifth year, you know, senior kind of leadership, not going to say anything, you know, to, you know, one way or the other as far as the play from the week before. And Oregon State's defense, you know, got challenged after that loss to Washington State. And, you know, particularly that first half was obviously just you know, all kinds of bad. You know, they were able to kind of clean things up a little bit in the second half, but you were playing catch up. On six days rest, not even rest, rather, but six days preparation, TJ, a short week, um, Oregon State put together one heck of a defensive effort. You know, whatever they did at practice this week, and we talked to Easton Mascarenas after the game, he said, best week of practice by far from the defense. And I think that's significant, like, you know, whatever, uh, you know, I, I think back to like uh, Space Jam and the, uh, the secret stuff from, you know, Mike in that particular movie, TJ, and it's like, whatever – the secret sauce was Trent Bray was dishing up this week in practice and credit to the players, the defensive leaders too. It was big time. We'll get into Utah and maybe how they weren't at full strength in a minute, but just start with Oregon state's impressive showing swarming defense. Well, you know that Utah to win this football game was going to have to run the football. They haven't passed the ball well all season long. And right. The Beavers held them to other under two yards of rush, knowing they're going to either going to run it with, with Nate Johnson or they're going to use Glover, or I don't know, Jaquin and Jackson didn't play. So it was mostly right. that group who was trying to run the football, and it it just wasn't effective. The Utah offense allowed the Beavers to be more aggressive. They were able to get in the backfield a little bit more often, and it was an opportunity as well to kind of shield your secondary, which after watching last week, people might have thought was the weakness, the clear weakness of this defense. Sure. Well, that wasn't an issue this week because Utah can't pass the ball. I What I come away with this, Brendan, like looking, it's like, okay, well, the Beavers played very well on defense. I'm not quite sure they redeemed themselves from last week and proved that that was just a one-week anomaly. I'm sure. not totally certain. And that's based off of the offensive prod uh, productivity on the other side for Utah, which we saw. It was just – it was so inept. They couldn't do anything. Yeah, I mean – you saw the cracks last week against UCLA scoring seven points, asking that defense to hold UCLA to seven. You know, they obviously uh, got the pick six and, you know, kudos to the defense in that matchup. But you could tell going into this game, like, you know, Utah, they need Cam Rising back and need him back like yeah. yesterday. And it's, and, you know, while you think may see, you know, may say, 
well, you know, Utah needs better pass catchers. They need to run the ball more. I mean, you know, the TJ mentioned running back to Quinton Jackson was out of the game. He's a stud player. And Nate Johnson and Bryson Barnes, and, you know, I hope Bryson Barnes is okay. I'm not sure if you saw after the game, TJ, he got taken to the hospital. So definitely uh, oh. best wishes uh, over to Bryson Barnes. Uh, I saw Kyle Whittingham mention that. Um, but neither one of those guys were really able to get much going through the air. And, you know, when you look at that and what TJ mentioned, the fact that Oregon State's strength is in stopping the run, the matchup, uh, you know, was very well. And then you talk about the atmosphere of Research Stadium just didn't give Utah anything. They looked, you know, intimidated, weren't able to quite, you know, get the offense going. And I think more than anything, it just showed that Oregon State could have a bounce back performance. Now, granted, they were at home versus on the road, Jonathan Smith era, particularly the last couple of years, only USC and the reigning Heisman Trophy winner have won in Corvallis. So it is a tough place to play. The Beavers make it tough. And, you know, they flexed their muscles yesterday. I mean, TJ talked about the garbage time, excuse me, touchdown. I mean, it was a great play by their tight end. Uh, stop me if you've heard that before. Utah tight end, great play. Uh, and they don't even have Brent Keithy back when, you know, he'll be joining the mix soon. But, you know, Dalton Kincaid was obviously a, a dude last year. You know, they pump out tight ends there at Utah. And the Beavers were able to, you know, mostly neutralize that matchup at, with the exception of, you know, that play there at the end. And, you know, I, 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 I agree with you, TJ. We need to see an offense test them. The interesting thing is I don't know if they'll see that offense for a couple weeks because you look at the matchup with Cal. While Cal put up 24 points in the win over Arizona State, that's not an offense I'm particularly worried about because Cal's strength is with Jaden Ott, terrific running back, maybe the only other running back other than maybe Bucky Irving at Oregon that I would put up there with Damian Martinez as like the elite the the guys in the conference uh, that I really, really like. And, you know, he's going to be a handful, but the Beavers kind of neutralized him last year. Uh, again, one time, you know, near Oregon State commit. So he's very familiar with the Beavers program. And then UCLA after that, who Utah held the seven points and Oregon State gets that game at home before the bye. So the schedule opens up in a nice way, TJ. So they might not get that full test you're talking about, particularly in the secondary for a few more weeks. But nevertheless, you can work from that with a win. Oregon State, had they suffered a loss, probably would have been out of the running for the Pac-12 championship. Again, a team did make it in with two losses. There was a three-way tie with two losses last year. The Pac-12 probably will beat up on itself. You know, Washington and Oregon have to play. One of those two teams will lose. You know, so on, so forth. USC, Oregon, yada, yada, so on, so forth. But if Oregon State had gotten two losses to open conference play, just like last year, TJ, <sighs> The writing would have kind of been on the wall. It would have been, but we watched this game and I think it reinforced the fact Oregon State, despite the performance in the Palouse or on the Palouse last week, they, they still belong. They absolutely right. still belonged. We saw the two most physical teams in the Pac-12 on the field on Friday. And Oregon State beat up Utah. They did. They did to Utah what Utah does to the rest That's of everybody. this conference, which you know, maybe your strength is not going to match up with Cam Ward and Ben Arbuckle and that spread offense with wide sure. receivers running all different directions. No, no, your strength is when the other team tries to line up directly across from you and hit you in the mouth and you hit them harder. And the Beavers, you know, flex that kind of muscle that they did on Friday. And that's what's going to have to win them games down the stretch when they're going to play some of these really good quarterbacks, you know, most notably looking at Michael Penix and Bo Nix the final two weeks of the season – also probably Jaden Delora when you go down to Tucson right. in November. Right. And again, you just mentioned the next three games. None of those opponents, I put it this way, TJ, they'll be favored against all those opponents. Like yep. they will probably not be the first game that comes up in question is obviously, you know, Washington at home. Uh, if the Huskies are undefeated, they'll probably be favored in that game, but had they suffered a loss, you never know, right? There's a long time between that stretch. So, in that regard, Oregon State got through two games that I think for very different reasons. Washington State for being a conference opener, Cam Ward, Ben Arbuckle being better, and also having to go play in Pullman. You know, that was a tough game in itself and maybe a game that Beaver fans didn't take quite as tough as they should have going into that matchup. I know it's hard, you know, not underestimating, but just maybe like assuming, okay, you can get a win in Pullman when that's a tough thing to do. Right. But and then after that, you're like, oh, ho-hum, you want to lick your wounds. You want to get back to your winning ways. 
oh, here comes the 10th ranked team in the country, regardless of their offensive ineptitude against the Beavers. This is still a Utah team that put up decent points against Florida, Baylor, and Weber State. Again, Weber State, FCS, but regardless, still put up decent points against those three teams. And, you know, we're 3-0 and in the non-conference with Nate Johnson and Bryson Barnes. They showed the cracks against Utah or against UCLA, excuse me. And then I think it's also worth noting, like, you just have to put, you know, there's no excuse that I don't put it as a Oregon State does win because of this. But you have to look at the context of how beat up Utah was physically and how they were just missing a bunch of key dudes. That's what Oregon State's supposed to do in a situation like that. To me, it just kind of puts a small little butt. But it doesn't take away the fact, TJ, pollsters will look at that tonight, Saturday night as we're recording, and say, Oregon State beat a top 10 team. And here's another thing uh, when, when we take a look at this. How are we gonna how are we gonna look at this offense, the Oregon State offense and, and the performance of DJ Uyungle, yes. who got critiqued last week against Washington State with too erratic early, not enough uh, as it comes down the stretch. And you know, against Utah, I, I I didn't think he was gonna have a big game. I don't think you thought he was gonna have a big game. It was gonna be a low scoring affair and Utah's sure. defense is very good. And they made Dante Moore's life absolute hell last week at Rice Eccles right. stadium. And DJ ends up again with a barely above 50% completion rate, a touchdown had one pretty boneheaded interception. That was a bad play. But he, yeah. You know, he did, he did really what he needed to like, I, 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 I do. We didn't get as much, I would say on, on the Colin show after the game, game last night, didn't get as much critique of DJ probably because they won. Uh, if they had lost, it would have been much different, which which was interesting because he, he, against this Utah defense, like we knew he was going to struggle. Like this unit makes everyone struggle. Jonah Ellis mm-hmm. put one of the nastiest spin moves I've seen yes. on Joshua Gray. Joshua Gray couldn't even get a hand on him, and Jonah Ellis just belts DJ and puts him in the ground yep. like that. Like that's the kind of pass rush he was facing, and, and that's the kind of defense he was facing. So I like I thought it was interesting. Because we look at this and it's like, okay, the Beavers got a top 10 win at home against a really good Utah team. But how much did we really learn about the offense and the defense as a unit? Well, yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I think we learned a lot about the offense in multiple ways. And let's start on that first drive, TJ. You knew coming into this game, it was going, and we, you know, you predicted a pretty low score and you, you know, and I, you know, was a little higher, but for the most part, you kind of knew this was going to be a slugfest. And, Entering, you know, the game, I really thought that, you know, Oregon State made a statement. The offense made a statement on that opening drive. After the defense turned over Utah on downs on their first drive, you got the crowd into it. If the offense hadn't scored on that first drive, TJ, I think it would have been a very different game. You get the ball back to Utah, it's 0-0. Maybe they're like, okay, we had one bad drive. But the way that Oregon State was able to efficiently move the ball on that series notably Damian Martinez had his longest run of the night on that series 14 yards and for Damian Martinez folks he'd been averaging you know eight yards a carry maybe a little less after the you know numbers came down a little after Washington State but he just was a chunk play kind of runner this year and when he gets that long run puts him into the goal line and then ultimately takes a big hit at the goal line but rolls in and gets that touchdown I think it kind of like mortally kind of shocked Utah to like, oh, wow, like they scored on their first drive. Like we were expecting to be able to contain these guys at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's where that drive combined with the dominance that Oregon State's defense was showing was enough to give them that advantage. And again, there were some missed opportunities for the offense. You mentioned it. I believe they punted six or seven times, you know, off the top of my head. I can't remember which one it was one of those two and you know you think about right before the half they missed an opportunity to get points and maybe go up 10 nothing or 14 nothing at the half but yet it never felt like Oregon State was in danger because the narrative of the crowd the defense and it felt like points were going to be at a premium so that's the first thing with the offense the second thing was TJ if they played this game last year and I'm not singling out Ben Branson or Chance Nolan but if they played this game last year, do they win? 
At the same point in the year, say just swap USC and Utah, for example, or swap Utah for Utah last year when they lost on the road. But let's, for the sake of this, say it was a home game. If this is a home game against 10th ranked Utah last year, does the offense do enough to make cracks in the defense and win? For me, I don't know that the offense could have not turned the ball over particularly or been efficient enough because outside of that first drive, you really thought Oregon State might win this game 7-7, and then you fact, factor in the fact that Utah was able to hit that big chunk play late, and if it had been a 7-7 game, everything changes. But I think back to the two explosive plays, and they go back to that guy, Silas Golden. Because Oregon State does not win this game without Ooh. Silas And you – What's you know, go to the catch first when you know, Oregon, you know, uh, he made s- several big time plays on this. On this, you know, I think about the, the play that DJ threw the fade route, and that was one of the prettiest passes I've seen DJ throw. And Silas Bolden obviously make it a great sideline catch, but his scoring touchdown play where he takes kind of the, the sideline catch, jukes out his defender, and is able to get into the end zone for the touchdown, standing up, walking in. If he's tackled there, maybe Utah's defense holds Oregon State to a field goal, right? And then second time, when Oregon State lines up in that fourth and one, creative play calling ultimately pitches it. Silas Bolden, I went back and looked at the tape to see if the flag entered his line of sight because you know how many players would maybe not go full speed, finish the play like he did if, that flag kind of flew right in front of him. Silas Bold, I don't think he saw it, obviously went all the way there because everybody in the stadium thought for a brief moment it was illegal formation, you know, something on Oregon State turned out to be offside. That was a huge momentum-changing play. I just look at this, TJ, and go, if some of the throws and some of the plays the receivers made, DJ or Chance, or sorry, Ben or Chance had to make to break the lid off an elite defense last year and Again, USC wasn't an elite defense last year. Oregon State still had four picks. I, I just, you know, I, I don't know if they win this game last year, and I think this was mm-hmm. the first time you saw where DJ was exactly the guy you brought him in to be. Hit the throws when you need to hit the throws to break the lid off the defense, but still grind it out with a run game. Was he perfect? No. TJ alluded to it. That pick – Terrible play. That's a throw that you don't make. You have to throw that ball out of bounds. Good news is the defense turned him away three and out right after that. It was a moot point. But that's still a throw. DJ's just got to chuck that one out of bounds. Uh, But outside of that, this is the first game where I said DJ's arm made enough plays to win a game against an elite opponent. Okay, so I'm going to say that If this game was played at home last year in the same scenario, I said the Beavers win by seven points instead of by 14. Okay. That's what I think. Yeah, I mean, I I don't disagree with that. I I personally think the ineptitude on the other side was just – was so great that, uh, like, the Beavers could have ran it 50 times, give Ben enough easy throws, and I – it probably could have worked out. I could be wrong. There's more margin for error in a seven-point game. So, that is what it is. Now, there there was – now, yeah. There were some say, throws. I'll say. I'll say this. There were some throws last night that Chance Nolan and Ben Gobranson are not capable of making, and, and that's no dis. That's no disrespect. We've talked about it all fall camp long. It's consistency with DJ because he can make every throw on the field, every one of them. Ab- yeah, absolutely. Why did they? Why did? Why was Charles in the game? I'm like here. I, I've been, I've been that pondering you're that you're going to try and yep. script Good transition. Of all games. Yep. You're going to script a yeah. series for your true freshman quarterback. It's oh, we only have a seven nothing lead at home against a top five defense in the country. With one of the best win. pass rushes in the country in a must win game against a front four that made Dante Moore's life a living hell last yeah. week. And just the third drive of the game, you put Childs into the game, makes one nice throw, a little bit underthrown on on his first throw, and then just takes two atrocious sacks. And then he's done for the game. And I'm curious, like, if you were trying to get DJ into a rhythm, why, why are you taking him out? Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting because I think more than anything, 
you know, I came to the conclusion that they're going to play him this year. They're going to make sure he feels like a part of this offense and a part of this team. And, and I think additionally, the timing was weird, but I think regardless, Brian Lindgren and Jonathan Smith said going into the game, DJ is going to start. We'll see how his first drive goes. After he scored the touchdown on the first drive, they're probably like, okay, throw him back out there again. Second drive punt, they're probably like, well, now's as good as any time to get him in. So it's not with the game on the line. Like, again, let's say yeah. worst case scenario happens, pick six, you're tied up, right? Worst right. case scenario, right? Absolute worst, you're tied up 7-7, seven, seven, no one's the wiser. That would have been unfortunate, but again, that's in the you know, other than an injury that is the absolute worst thing that could have happened. So I think the fact that that didn't happen obviously speaks to, you know, the, the situation. But overall, I agree with you. That's kind of how I rationalized it in my head. Um, you know, Jonathan Smith kind of said in the post game, you know, they just kind of wanted to get him a drive. And, you know, that was pretty much it. He didn't really get asked about it a whole ton. And I think it's because, you know, DJ made the throws and the quarterback con. There is no quarterback controversy, in my opinion. There never was. And that's not a knock on Aiden Childs at all. I just – I think DJ is going to get better. He's going to be like a fine wine, folks. He's going to get better as the season ages and goes along. And, you know, I, I really do think that when you – like we mentioned earlier, with the schedule softening up a bit, I think you'll have opportunities for him to get back into a rhythm and be playing his best ball at the end of the season when Oregon State's got those matchup against ranks opponents. But – you know, TJ and I pretty much covered it as far as like, you know, um, how Oregon State's offense went about it in this one. And then even, um, you know, with Aiden Childs and, you know, I also got to give credit to the offensive line in this game. As TJ mentioned, the the, de the defensive line of Utah, you know, just because Oregon State put up 21 points, folks, doesn't take away from what we mentioned all week long and what I said in my postgame breakdown yesterday. Kyle Whittingham still says this is one of the best defenses he's ever had at Utah ever and you know will it have injuries taken a toll absolutely will they be by the end of the year who knows but just pound for pound talent for talent you know Kyle Whittingham said last week that was one of the best defensive performances he's ever seen in Rice Eccles Stadium uh TJ he's pretty sure he was a defensive coordinator on an Urban Meyer undefeated season I'm pretty sure he had some yeah. pretty pretty impressive uh moments himself yeah. as a head coach so yeah i'll say that 2019 they, defense was uh was pretty yeah, nasty they I, like they abused some opponents in that stadium yeah like like big wit you know again ton of respect for kyle whittingham you know i i, I you know he's the dean of pac-12 coaches and he's not going to just throw that out there to throw that out there so that part of it is where oregon state has to hang their hat but tj's right there's still a lot the the offense has to improve particularly, you know, tightening up their, you know, passing game. I think continuing to work in creative play calling. Again, I love the play call to Silas Bolden, putting him in the backfield. Utah was not ready for that play. Uh, and then defensively, getting the secondary to keep coming along. I mean, Jaden Robinson got hurt in that game last night. He didn't play in the second half. Jonathan Smith said it was a hamstring. Eh, you know, that he might not play this next weekend. And, you know, not to mention you toss in Calvin Hart. And James Rawls, both going to miss the first half of that game due to targeting. Uh, good news there is that they'll both return in the second half. Jonathan Smith said that Rawls, uh, you know, he got banged up on that play, needed to be helped out. Thankfully, you know, for him, no injury there. Smith said he actually could have come back if he was eligible. But, you know, Oregon State will likely be starting a new inside linebacker next to uh, uh, Eastern Mascarenas. And then they'll trot out, you know, probably – couple new corners that I would imagine Cal will look to probably target early on uh, with the Beavers likely expecting them to run the ball with Jaden Ott, who is, again, is a, a really good player. So we saw Noble Thomas. He played pretty good. TJ, he was a guy we saw a little bit of in fall camp. Him and Jermod McCoy uh, were really kind of two of those dudes who, you know, younger guys, I should say, rather in the secondary who had impressed. You know, I think we could also see – Drake Vickers, I haven't d dove into the snap counts yet and, and you know, gotten all the exact numbers as of recording this podcast, but we didn't see a whole lot of, you know, Trice Ivy, and I think that was probably nope. a little bit by design after he was pulled last week, so that'll be something to see if he kind of moved to a more special teams role, but the response was good. We'll see how it fares when they get in the ring against a team that can throw the ball significantly better, and I'll say this, TJ – it probably won't be Cal. It'll probably no. be Dante Moore because Cal, you know, Sam Jackson, they're, they're going to run the ball. And that favors Oregon State again as long as they don't show, you know, 
as long as they show up to what will be a sleepy atmosphere in Berkeley, most likely, uh, they, they should be in a good spot. Hey, Cal announced 34,000 this weekend today. Didn't look in like 34,000. In an 80,000 seat stadium? Maybe 75, something like that. Is it 80? Is it 80? I think, let's look at old Memorial Stadium. A little uh, great podcasting here. Um, yeah. And and, I, and I, searching I, on the fly. But uh, yeah, TJ. Uh, okay, I was uh, Damn, I, 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 spot, I spotted them a couple thousand. Uh, 63. 63. <laughs> yeah. I Man, thought it was bigger. Be, inter- yeah, it's a big stadium. It's a sizable bowl. It is. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting matchup with Cal next week. You mentioned, like, they, they've they been trying to decide which quarterback they've wanted to play. They went with Sam Jackson today against right. ASU. And I don't know if he really made his case to be a, a, star, a, a, a true starter. ASU's defense, despite all of the Sun Devils struggles, that's been their strong point this season. And they held Sam Jackson to 12 of 29 passing the football, just a 41% completion rate. And they ran the ball 48 times. 29 of those yeah. was, was Jaden Ott. And, you know, like this is a game Cal was favored by two touchdowns at home and they only won by three. Right. And a big difference in the game, ASU missed on a couple of fourth downs, including they went for it at their own 31-yard line in that right. game and and Cal took over scored a touchdown you look at it that's the difference between a win and a loss right there if you decide to play field position with your defense that's playing so well opposed to trying to force the issue on offense right and you get a short field and you punch it in for a touchdown it's gonna be interesting it, it's me interesting how they respond to the environment at Cal how if Cal tries to pass the ball because we did see Utah early on this game they, they tried passing the football Football against right. Oregon State secondary, like no, there's no chance. I mean, they had went the last two weeks with 100 rushes and 38 passes, and well, look at the first couple of drives. I mean, they had uh, Nate Johnson dropping back and and trying to throw. It didn't work out, obviously. Uh, struggles right. at quarterback, struggles at tight end, struggles at receiver, struggles with timing, struggles with drops. That all helped out the Oregon State secondary, and it's probably going to be similar next week at at Cal. Right. So here's the crazy deja vu, TJ. So I had to look this up just to make sure. How did the Be- how did the Beavers avoid two years ago? Two years ago, 2021, they lose their first conference game up in Martin Stadium at Pullman. Sound familiar? They bring yep. in Utah the next week. Utah loses their only game in conference as they proceed to run the table with cam rising and represent you know the pac-12 and the rose bowl that year the week after oregon state takes down utah tj they lose 39 25 at cal in memorial stadium that was the first of two games that ultimately got tim tibasar fired as the beavers lost to Colorado the next week and allowed 37 points. How did, like, obviously we know how, because, you know, no offense, they have much more competent defensive coaching. That's an observation, not a criticism. So just, just going to throw that out there, but how did they (laughs) avoid, you know, that was a huge win to beat Utah Mm -hmm. two years ago. It was a little bit later in the year. Again, October, they lost to Cal in the end of October, beat Utah mid or mid to late October, a little bit later in the, in the slate, but the three-game stretch was still the same. Washington State, Utah at Cal. So two years ago, the Beavers had a improving, not great squad yet. Went down there and learned a hard lesson. I imagine after you know relearning a hard lesson against Washington State, I think the Beavers would be really motivated to go down there and have a good showing, TJ. Off the top of my head, tell me if I'm remembering this correctly. So Cal did go up 14-0 in that game. Like right off the bat within the first, I think, five minutes of the game, it was 14-0. Uh, fourteen nothing Cal, which gives an offense led by Chance uh, Nolan a group that was was good, but not, yeah, not elite yep. in any sense. They went up, they went a, up a real uh, tough hill to climb up. But I, I'm thinking, I th- it was what it was the first or second play of the game. The Beavers start with the football, they fumble it, give it to Cal inside the twenty yard line. Cal goes in, scores a touchdown. The Beavers get the ball back. They go three and out. Right. They punt it back, and Cal goes right back down the field and scores again probably not doing that is a, is a good start because if you ever spot a team 14 points fumbling on your first play from scrimmage, usually that right. doesn't lead to many good things. But this is a significantly better defense. This is a significantly more talented offense, uh, both that quarterback, along the offensive line, at right. receiver. 
less li- it's less likely that that's going to happen. But I would say that's a probably a good start if, if not to spot your opponent fourteen. Yeah, you know it's going to be interesting because again, I, I you know it'll be. I think Cal is ultimately better this year than they were two years ago. They went five and seven two years ago. I could see Cal. You know, I don't think they're quite as bad as they're kind of made out to be. I mean, again, the looking at their non-conference a bit, I know they were down to Idaho, and that was a game they had to come back and win. But, you know, they put up 32 on Washington. I know they allowed 60, but that still tells me that, like, they can put up points a little bit. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because at the same token, here's the real key, TJ – They very nearly beat Auburn, who gave Georgia a game today. So I just, you know, you can't take anybody for granted in this conference other than, well, um, I'll say this, you know, I think they kind of woke up as of recording this podcast, but the old Stanford Cardinal, who lost to an FCS team, had an early lead on the old old boys from Eugene. So we'll see how that one ultimately uh, fleshes itself out, but you really can't sleep on anybody in this conference, TJ. And I think Oregon State maybe knew that, maybe, you know, learned that lesson again going into Washington State after, you know, beating them the year before and feeling pretty good about themselves. Not saying they were overconfident, but maybe not quite the level of focus they needed. And I think that they will. I think they'll go down and take care of business against a Cal team that, you know, they're playing decent football. They're three and two on the year. Their losses are to Washington and Auburn. Not. You know, nothing to scoff at. I mean, Auburn's, you know, that's a respectable loss anytime, you know, just for the school that they are. And then at Washington in Husky Stadium to open Pac-12 play, that's as tough as it gets, TJ. This is going to be a trap game. I think this earns the label as a trap game. I agree. Like Cal, as you mentioned, has played very good opponents, very close. The Beavers are also probably going to be around a two touchdown favorite i would say so give or take i'd say probably 13 and a half points so that you know the expectation is there vegas thinks you should win by two touchdowns which right. means cal is playing with house money playing in their, their their own stadium it's going to be a late night kickoff got a lot of time to sit around and think on saturday of how the game's right. going to go out it's going to be on the pac-12 network all these factors leading into like, oh, better show up and be ready and better start fast. The big difference in the two conference games for the Beavers is what they did, what happened on the Beavers' first drive of the game and how those two first drives ended. Against Utah, you force a fourth down stop, go down the field, punch Utah in the mouth, run for half your eight yards in the game, go up 7 nothing, and don't look back. Washington State, first drive of the game, you blow a coverage for a wide-open 40-plus right. yard touchdown and then fail on offense. And right. not fail on offense, you get like an explosive run, but then Damian drops a pitch, and, and it just goes all downhill from there. Like, they're just the two polar opposites. And you'd probably want the Utah version when you're playing Cal next week. Right. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, like you said, you covered a lot of great things there. And I think I think it definitely can earn the, the label of a trap game in, you know, more than anything, like you said, uh, a lot of time to think. You know, if there is one advantage for TJ or one advantage for Oregon State, TJ, I see it being that the Beavers get an extra day, right? Cal played during the day today, but Oregon State got to get their game done. And, you know, it's one thing to watch a team on film because you're usually playing while that team is playing. I think it's an advantage that probably most of Oregon State watched the Cal game today. They got up and were Mm -hmm. probably like, cool, it's a college football Saturday. We get to watch college football while, you know, having already taken care of business. So I think, you know, an extra day of preparation certainly can't hurt. You know, I think back to the San Jose State game, how good they looked in that game, having the tape on San Jose State and a little extra time to prepare. So as long as Oregon State is able to, you know, keep their wits about them and not underlook Cal and not, you know, be able to kind of create their own energy in an environment that's probably going to be pretty dead. I mean, again, Cal's yeah. three and two, they might, they might get some more people after winning today. But I doubt it. We'll, we'll see. I mean, you know, like but, I said, Cal, future ACC member, TJ. So, yeah. you know, I got to put some could, respect uh, on their name. I was going to say they could pull a Dan Lanning and just not play any music at practice. I, I'm, <laughs> honestly, that's something I'm going to pay attention to on Tuesday and Wednesday when I'm when I'm there. Yeah. Grab a video for us. Are they, are they playing yes, any sir. music at practice? Yeah, because that's a good point. Because the, uh, the, the, the team down south didn't. They decided just this week not to play any music before playing Stanford and Pretty similar envir- environment across the Bay, Bay and Berkeley. So 
Yeah, no doubt. So it'll be interesting to see again. Oregon State uh, set to play Cal uh, this next Saturday at 7 p.m. Uh, Oregon State's back on the Pac-12 network, so that's where you can find that. Uh, we'll have coverage uh, all week at BeaversEdge.com with uh, TJ leading the charge uh, and Dylan uh, uh, Callahan Crowley also uh, contributing, Ryan Harlan as well. Uh, you guys will be uh, keeping tabs on the week that is for me as I uh, tend to uh, some other family matters this week. And uh, I'll be back uh, Saturday night, uh, just right around the time the kickoff is. So I'll be definitely joining in and uh, breaking down the game for you guys and all that stuff. Uh, but yes, TJ uh, will be chit-chatting with the players this week. So definitely make sure to head on over to beaversedge.com. Subscribe to beaversedge.com. All the best stuff at beaversedge.com. Our staff picks, injury reports, detailed uh, video interviews. Most of our stuff that we do do at Beaver's Edge, you know, it is, you know, subscriber based in the sense that we you know we provide a a tailored experience for our subscribers so if you're not subscribed check it out we got 30 day free trial uh, up on the front page it's a great way to get in see everything that we have to offer over at beaversedge.com and also you get access to chat with us you know you got a question for tj drop it on the board we'll answer it you know same for dylan on the recruiting side or me on the team side also recruiting as well so it's a uh, it's a great place to uh, chit chat with other beaver fans and learn a little bit more uh, about uh about us the team and everything else so uh tj appreciate you uh, joining me a couple days ahead of time to do this podcast uh we'll be sure to uh check back in uh, after the Cal game uh, when Oregon State uh, is set to uh, return home for a matchup with uh, Chip Kelly's UCLA Bruins. So that should be exciting uh, times as well. So uh, for TJ Matthewson, this is Brendan Slaughter signing off on this edition of the Edge podcast. Stay tuned to beaversedge.com for all the latest Oregon State coverage.